get saved and um, use their lives for God. Oh, my turn. Well, camp is very fun. Um, this is my second year getting to go, and sadly my last year as a camper because I'm getting old. Why do I have to do that? I mean, really? Nah. Anyway, camp is so much fun. You get to do so much, and but the best part really is the preaching. You get to hear people that you don't get to hear all the time. Pastor is a very great preacher, but getting to hear somebody different, it really helps. And I just realized that I'm not as good a witness as I could be, and I need to do a better job. There are family, friends. I go to a, com I go to a community college in BB, and there are people I see every day that don't know Christ that I'm not telling. I should be. So, next. The preaching is really, really good, and the games are fun. Oscar was fun. <laughs> Watching JD eat pie was funny. Decisions, watching decisions being made, touches your heart. And I wish I'd get to go back as a camper again, but can't. <laughs> well, camp was pretty fun. Oscar was probably the third funnest, funniest, funniest thing. Uh, lots of decisions uh, were made from for me from yeah from me for me I don't know um um okay um there was lots of activities funness and craziness in the dorms. lots and lots of fun. I really liked the sermons that they did um, that week, and Jonathan Wells is an awesome preacher. He does lots of sound effects, which keeps, you know, you awake and stuff, so you're not, like, falling asleep and stuff, and I had lots of fun chasing goats around, and I got one of the ribbons off of the goats, which was pretty cool, and I'm glad I didn't have to chase chickens, because they're kind of scary, and <laughs> um, Um, I had a really great, fr uh, good time, and I made a lot of friends and everything. And I really liked the preaching on what Aaron said earlier about having a hard heart and to make it softer. And he also said, if you're a friend of the world, you're not a friend of God. And I would rather be a friend of God than of the world. Well, I played um, black football this year with Taylor and Tyler and Caleb and Johnson and two other kids I don't know. But um, my favorite message was from Jonathan Wells. It was uh, respond, respect, and obey. And yeah. <laughs> you stand up, you gotta do a stand up with me. Okay. Now, did you, did you eat some ribs at my house Friday night? Did you like them? Yeah. Who's the best rib cook in the whole world? Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> Caleb, where's Caleb? Caleb, you ate some of my ribs, didn't you? Friday night? You ate some of the ribs, didn't you? Were they good? Just yes or no, were they good? Yeah, he, you should have He polished those things off where they shine. You heard all about it, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just trying to put a plug in for myself here, but Joshua, did you enjoy camp, all right? Yes. Did you have a good time? Yes. Did you like preaching? Yes. Did you like fellowshipping with the other kids? Yes. Playing the games? Yes. He's a man of few words, but we appreciate it. Okay, you can have a seat. <laughs> this year I came prepared. I wrote it down before I came up here. Okay, so I'm just going to read it before I cry. Okay. 
I have fun at camp every year, but this year was different in the fact that I kept feeling. <laughs> like God wants me to live for him every day, not just a church camp. So that's the decision that I've made to live for him. <laughs> Give my heart and my life to him. And me and Erica were talking on Tuesday night late, <laughs> which was stupid because we had to get up early. <laughs> but, oh, like, <sighs> thank you, Erica. <sighs> I'm ready to live for God. <laughs> So you can see we had several decisions that were made while we were there, and that's, uh, that's why we go to camp each year, is, uh, is to see that happen, and uh, a lot of people make those decisions, and we stick with them, and one of the reasons why we want to tell you about the decisions that we've made is so you can help us uh, stay accountable with those, and uh, I even think, I think Joshua, uh, one night, uh, he got assurance of his salvation, made sure that uh, he got all that settled, and so we were excited about that. And, I know we had several other decisions made as well, and uh, that's the uh, that's the ultimate purpose for going to camp. And if you, uh, as parents, you know that you're sending your kids there, it's not just about sending them and spending the money so they have a place to go for a week or so you have a vacation where they get to have fun. Uh, we do all of those things, but at the end of the day, you know that you're sending your kids somewhere that's a spiritual atmosphere, and uh, if you're somebody that helps sponsor kids to send them, uh, you're investing in these kids and teens lives and hopefully they'll uh, they'll stick with these commitments and ask them about it uh, down the week because when we get back from camp it's easy to make those decisions at camp and it's easy to keep them week number one and it's excited to be about those uh, it's excited to uh, about those decisions the first couple weeks but after two or three weeks a month month and a half you get back into your regular routine and it's easy to forget about the things that you said you were going to do and so if you ask us about it uh, that helps keep us uh, accountable and it keeps it fresh on our minds and we remember uh, what we told you we were going to do and what we were going to change and what we were uh, what we promised uh, God we were going to do and so ask us about those decisions and help keep us accountable and we would appreciate that all right we're going to do some awards here we left on Thursday night after camp camp ends uh, on Friday morning each year and so because it was the 4th of July and we already decided that we were going to come home on Thursday night. So we missed out on the awards on Friday morning that was there. So they packed them up for us and sent it home so we could do it. So unless they've texted friends and found out what the outcome of things were, uh, this will be the first time that they found out what they won. These are uh, awards from the Carnival Day. They've got a bunch of different events like the chicken stealing and the, and the uh, cow chip frisbee and the cow milking contest and uh, it's not a real cow, though. It's a, it's a fake cow that has Gatorade in it. So uh, that's an interesting kind of cow. But uh, <clears throat> how many of you caught a pig? How many of you guys caught a pig? All right. Goats? They just got the ribbons off the goats. They didn't have to carry it. But the guys caught pigs, carried them. That's right. You have the, uh, you have the proof that you carried pigs on some of your shirts, I think. Uh, you can make sure you show those to your parents. All right. We'll call your names, and Erica, if you want to come down here, you can just hand them the ribbon. Stand up, and she'll get your ribbon to you. Uh, in archery, in the archery contest, senior boys. We had somebody who finished in third place, and it was Caleb. Caleb. Now, Caleb is not a senior. He is a junior, but somehow he ended up on the senior boys list, so everything he competed in again in was against all of the seniors so he was he was the third best archery shooter there at the camp all right <clears throat> in the boot race cowboy boot race they have a huge pair of boots that they let you put on uh fourth place and the senior girls division goes to jade Rowland. it helps when you have feet her size they fill out the boots she runs in it easier we didn't have any boys that won anything in the boot race. Must have small feet. <laughs> Cowboy football throw. And a tie for third place is Audrey. And second place goes to Mary Jo. 
in the football toss. Junior boys in a tie for fourth place goes to Noah. Four-way tie for fourth place in the senior boys division goes to Taylor. And first place in the senior boys division football throw goes to Caleb. Caleb, he's a better football. He, I mean, he. We got a quarterback here better than all the senior guys that are at camp. <clears throat> Cow Chip Frisbee. Now you can be proud of this, mothers. Cow Chip Frisbee. Senior girls. Fourth place goes to Jade Rowland. Throwing cow chips, yeah. And first place, senior girls. Cow Chip Frisbee goes to Mary Jo. <clears throat> cow milking. Fifth place goes to Jade. Senior girls, fifth place. Third place, Mary Jo. Second place in the junior boys goes to Noah. Second place, cow milking to Noah. Third place, senior boy cow milking, Taylor. Second place, senior boys cow milking, Tyler. Chicken stealing. This is always fun, the chicken stealing. Uh, Madison Swan won fifth place in that for the junior girls. <clears throat> Mary Jo took home fourth place for the senior girls. And yes, we have a first place chicken stealer in the senior girls division. Two years in a row, Jade. <clears throat> Where does she practice this at? <laughs> With her own chickens or is it neighbor's chickens? Okay. <clears throat> senior boys chicken stealing. Fourth place goes to Taylor. Wheelbarrow race, we didn't have anybody win that. Stick horse hurdles. I got stick horse racing. I don't know, call the camp. That's their problem. <clears throat> I just have a list with names on it. Uh, tater sack race, fifth place, senior girls, Mary Jo. Fourth place, junior boys, Noah. Fifth place, senior boys, Tyler. Fourth place, senior boys, Taylor. We're all good at fourth place, yes. In the rifle range. Second place, junior boys goes to Noah. Third place, senior boys goes to Taylor. And first place, senior boys goes to Tyler. Cowboy Olympics. I forgot. We didn't get any video of that in there. We had video of Audrey doing it. She runs very girly in this, but that's why it probably didn't make it. Uh, Cowboy Olympics is in the arena where you saw the football going on. In the arena, they set up tires. You run through tires. You push a wheelbarrow. You spin your head on a bat. You run down a plank. You jump through some more tires. So it's an obstacle course. Uh, fifth place, Cowboy Olympics, goes to Mary Jo. And first place in Cowboy Olympics goes to Jade. Is that two years in a row? Yes. Fifth place, senior boys, goes to Taylor. And let's see. Uh, six on six flag football. Third place goes to the Patriots. Anybody that was a member of the Patriots team? Um, I don't know. We'll find out. Just hand out. Just leave one ribbon there if there's enough. I don't know if they sent one for everybody or just one for the team. They finished third place in the uh, flag football. We've got a lot of good videos. Maybe there's some uh, potential talent over here. I don't know. Um, hang on a second. Got something, I think. Marcus, can you go to the sound booth and turn channel four up for me? Channel four, about halfway. <clears throat> six on six girls volleyball. 
we have a first place team. Two years in a row. Oh, okay. Non consecutive years. They are two time volleyball champions at Royal Sea Ranch, and we have the Flying Sock Monkeys. Turn around, show your trophies. That's right. Thank you. You can turn it down. All right, here we get to uh, competition that we had indoors. This is the music competition. We start with instrumentals. In the senior division instrumentals, we have a third place to Audrey for her piano piece. Third place, senior solos. Fifth place to Mary Jo. Third place to Tyler. First place to Taylor. Duets. Second place goes to Jade and Audrey. First place to Taylor and Tyler. Trios. First place goes to Jade, Audrey, and Mary Jo. Quartets. First place goes to Kimberly, Mary, wrong names. First place goes to, I don't know who those people are, Jade, Mary Jo, Taylor, and Tyler. That is first place quartets. Was there just one? Yeah. Everybody gets a ribbon. Everybody's a winner. And second place in choirs goes to Liberty Baptist Church. Yay, one ribbon. All right. I think that's all of our awards. Everybody come down here and stand up front. Let's get your awards. I need to get a picture of this. All right, you know, I'm pretty proud of these kids. I mean, where, where else could you find a group that can throw cow chips and I mean, those ladies did pretty good with the couch chip throwing. I mean, you have to have a delicate touch. Those things will come apart on you. Yeah. Right. Let me move out of the way. Give him a hand, yeah. Well, seriously, uh, I'm very proud of them. I tell you what, they they won those things because they participated. Can I just give? Can I just tell you, you ought to be proud of your kids when they participate. Participation is uh, the key to success. If you, there's no saying if you. If you aim high at an eagle and miss, if you aim high, it's better to aim high at an eagle and miss than it is to aim low and hit a skunk. <laughs> and uh, so if you aim high, you participate, you accomplish something. Well, I think the young people are going to sing for us now, aren't they? Is it time for that? All right. Come ahead, young folks, and uh, sing for us, and then we'll finish up our message.
say something and I want you to believe me when I say I'm very very sincere I believe that God is working in those young people's lives in a great way now you just look at the average you look at the average young person in America and uh, if you can't see a difference where well, you're not looking <laughs> there's a huge difference and I, I see these young people growing and can I just take that a step further and say that I see a tremendous amount of growth and some adults and if we're all growing together we're accomplishing something and I believe God is pleased when he sees growth now I wish we had a I wish we had a double amount of people in the room I wish we had uh, a thousand here uh, that'd be about double <laughs> but I uh, I'm also sincere when I say if I had to choose I don't think you have to but if I had to choose, as a pastor, I would rather have a small church with people who love the Lord and are growing in grace, growing in the Lord, than to have a thousand people who are doing nothing. And so, I mean, really when you weigh it out, <laughs> a handful of people that love God. Well, do you remember the story of Gideon? Gideon was a nobody and, got, and he got a bunch of soldiers to go with him to battle. And God just started thinning them out, thinning them out, thinning them out. And, he, and Gideon ended up with a little handful of soldiers. And they did a greater job than they could have done with all the Freddy cats that turned back and, uh, and left them. And so I want to tell you, I'm, I'm proud of our church. I'm proud of our young people. I'm proud of our uh, parents and our adults. And I think God is doing a work. And I believe God is seeing some growth in us, and uh, I'm happy about that. Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and we'll see if we can finish up uh, a little bit of the sermon that was left from this morning, and uh, I'm glad we took time to recognize uh, Camp Week, and uh, Lord willing, we'll not have a long sermon. I'll be able to finish it and get us out of here on time, and so I want to read from the beginning in chapter number 11, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 28. We won't read the whole passage as we did this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse number 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Speaking of the Lord's Supper. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, 
When you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. And that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Father, bless us now in this last part of the service when we want to do honor to the Word of God. And Lord, we pray that you'd use this, this passage of Scripture, this message, Lord, to plant seed in our heart that would cause us to grow even closer to you. Lord, I am, I am very pleased to see people growing in grace and, and serving you in ways that they've not served you before and having a dedication that they've not had before and tender hearts that they've never had before. And Lord, I pray that you just keep working in us. May we see revival in our little group of people who love you. And Lord, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Gave the title to the message this morning, A Cheap Imitation. And the passage of Scripture is uh, primarily about the Lord's Supper and how that group of people at the Church of Corinth had degenerated the Lord's Supper into a just kind of a brawl, a riot, a banquet where they went, and uh, they just had enough of the technicalities of the Lord's Supper left in it where they kind of felt like they were doing something religious, but it wasn't accomplishing much. In fact, Paul said, I, he said, I can't praise you in this. He said, because you're, you're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. You know what he's saying? He's saying, when you come together as a church and you act that way, you've actually done more harm than you've done good. In other words, you might as well have stayed home if that's all you're going to do is come to church and act like a bunch of nincompoops, and that's what he's saying to them. And uh, they, they had very well disappointed the apostle, and so he was trying to clean up the mess for them. And, uh, and we took this passage of Scripture and we broke it down into three sections, and we said that, first of all, Paul presents to them a case of hypocrisy in the church. And uh, there's a pattern that's developing. They had known the way to have the Lord's Supper. They had known how they should do it. And yet it had become nothing more than riotous living. And so we saw the pattern of hypocrisy. Then we started on number two, a picture of holiness. So in the first section, Paul shows them, he says, now here's what's wrong, here's what you're doing wrong. Now he takes them to a passage of Scripture where the, the Lord is giving that final instructions to his disciples on the night before he was betrayed and he says now this is what the Lord gave us for the Lord's Supper it's to be a, a very solemn time it's to be a time of holiness it's a time of dedication to the Lord not a time of self will and selfishness and uh, so he, he shows them the right thing to do after he shows them what's wrong he says now here's the way it ought to be and uh, we said the cross pictures or, or the, uh, the Lord's Supper is pictured in, in the Lord's Supper pictures the cross and it also pictures his resurrection. And uh, it also pictures his coming again. He said, do this as often as you do it. Do it in remembrance of me uh, till the Lord comes again. And so we explained that. And so then we made the application. Here's where we left off this morning. We made the application. We said that the Lord's Supper, the fact that those Corinthians had polluted the Lord's Supper observance to the point where it was just nothing more than chaos and uh, and a... And really, it was a black eye to the church. And uh, we were beginning to make the application how that doesn't just happen on the observance of the Lord's Supper, but it happens in every area of life. And uh, it happens in family. And we talked about that in Psalm 128, how that uh, the family today has degenerated and people don't have a, a real good view of the family today. A dysfunctional family doesn't even know it's dysfunctional anymore because there's not very many uh, biblical families around to set the proper example. Can you say amen? And so when things degenerate, we need to first be able to see the fault. And families are really falling apart. I mean, when, when, uh, when you've got people redefining marriage as two men living together as husband and wife. Something is very, very wrong with that. Every culture in the world has recognized that for millennia, that that is not good. It's not good. It's sinful. And even unchristian nations have recognized that that's not right, and they didn't tolerate it. And, uh, and you've got families, you've got people uh, living today, living together today, and, and they pretty well just 
poo-poo the family and say, you know, uh, marriage is on its way out and there's no need for that piece of paper that proves that you're quote-unquote married to each other. Just move in, live together, and uh, enjoy one another as long as you can. And if things don't go well, just move out and go get another one. And uh, so the family has degenerated. Kids are running wild up and down the streets. And uh, we saw that in Philadelphia where uh, families are perpetuating a horrible situation. Drug users are sleeping around the neighborhood, producing more little kids that grow up to be drug users, prostitutes and drug users. And, uh, and it's because they don't really have anybody else to look at around there and figure out. Those poor little kids grow up thinking that mommy sleeps with a different guy every week, and so they don't know what a daddy's supposed to be. They don't know what it's like to get up at breakfast time and see the same men sitting at the table. They don't know what it's like to, uh, to have daddy come home from work and, and to have a family sit around the table and read the Bible together and, and to take the family to church together and a daddy that protects his family and provides for his family. And, and many times mom ends up having to do that all by herself. And so families uh, have degenerated. And so Paul is pointing out the fact that, that anything can go downhill. And he's pointing it out in the illustration of the Lord's Supper. Now, we're going to move on from the family now to the church. Things can degenerate in church in general. <clears throat> I mentioned this this morning. This is, I believe, where I stopped. You asked the average person on the street, what should a church be? The average person on the street is not going to say, well, they ought to be in the soul-saving business. <laughs> average person doesn't have a clue about that. In fact, they think that the church is just kind of another welfare office. And... Uh, that's about the extent of it. But the Bible gives us a different picture of the church. Now, should we help take care of folks in need? Well, of course we should. But that's not the primary purpose for the church existing. I mean, government is trying to take that role on, but right now the church... Here, Let me take you to uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. We'll get the Great Commission there. That's the marching orders for the church. We're talking about... Things being degenerated into chaos. The Lord's Supper degenerates into chaos, and so does the church as a whole. Matthew chapter 28, just before the Lord went back to heaven after his resurrection, in, in verse number 18. Matthew 28, verse number 18. Now here's what, here's what the Lord meant for the church to do. Are you with me? What's the church supposed to do? Right here it is. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven, and in earth, 19, verse 19, go ye, what's the next word? Therefore, okay, he's, he's resurrected now. There's resurrection power. The day of Pentecost is at hand. The church is going to be, the church is going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to go out and do what? Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. All through the, through the earth. Yeah, and so that's what he's talking about here in verse 19. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach them what? The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The sinless Son of God dying on the cross as a substitute for our sins. So teach all nations. Then what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what do we do? We try to get people saved. Next, we try to get them in the baptistry. That identifies them as one of us. That identifies, puts the badge on them. They've been deputized as believers, and they identify with us. They identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So then what's the next thing? He says in verse 20, watch this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So here, the... the the marching orders for the church is to go out, to go and to win the lost, bring them in and baptize them so they're identified with the church. Hey, listen, I, I don't believe that in the Bible you will find that God's in favor of loose canon Christianity. God doesn't mean for people to get saved and just wander around aimlessly and not have direction. God wants people to be saved, baptized in a local Baptist church, Bible-believing church, and then become a member of that church. There's so many people today who say, well, I'm just a member of the universal church. Oh, what's the address of that? <laughs> where, 
where do they gather? <laughs> uh, God established local churches for people like you and me so that we could gather together in a locality. Uh, if you're a member of, of a mystical body, it's hard to gather together without a local body. And so God established a local church. Everybody ought to be a member of a, of a Bible preaching church. And, uh, and that channels our resources. That channels our giftedness. We're going to be in gifts and spiritual gifts right away in the book of 1 Corinthians on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> We're going to come to the spiritual gifts. And God puts us together within the body of Christ with certain spiritual gifts so that we function together as a unified organism. We're a living organism as a church. And God gifts certain people and puts certain people in church. That's why it's important that everybody be here. Because God gave a gift or gifts to every believer that's a member of Liberty Baptist Church. And when one of us is missing, the body doesn't function the same way. And so God meant for us to be together. Now, go to 1 Peter 5, 1. We're talking about how the... Not just how the Lord's Supper has degenerated, but how church has degenerated. So we've seen in general what the Lord Jesus wanted us to do is to be witnesses all over the world and to go through the channel of the local church. Anytime my wife and I have moved uh, away from a, a locality, we would be the member of another. We've been saved for... Uh, well, she's been saved three years longer than I have. I've been saved, I think, for 34 years. And every time, we've only belonged to three churches, haven't we? Three churches. Mount Pleasant, Oklahoma City, Denver, and Liberty. Four, I guess. And uh, so out of nearly 40 years, we've only belonged to four churches. And whenever we moved, well, in our case, we always knew which church we were going to be at before we ever moved. We knew where we were going. We didn't move if we didn't know there was a good church there. We didn't move without a purpose. And so as soon as we got there, we didn't go to more than two services, any of them, before we joined the church. Now, friend, it doesn't take a long time. It doesn't take a long time in a city the size of Searcy to figure out if there's a Bible-believing church or not. I believe I could go to any city in America the size of Searcy, and within a month or two, I could know what every a lot less than that, but I'm just being rather liberal in the uh, application, but I believe I could find out if there's a Bible preaching church in any city in America within a month or two, and I'd be a member of the best one I could find. And it's not always the biggest one. I choose a church, first of all, it's got to be a, a church that believes right. If it doesn't believe right, I don't belong there. Let me say that again. If it doesn't believe right, I don't belong there. And secondly, there may be more than one that believes right. The second thing is, not, I'm just not going to go and join the biggest church because they have the biggest buildings, the prettiest place, and the most eloquent preacher. I'm going to the place where God can use me the most. See, a lot of people go and join the biggest church in town because they've got a great uh, children's program, they've got a great youth group, and they've got, they got good entertainment, and they've got good music, and they've got all of the best facilities, and, and, uh, and so everything is hunky-dory, and they go and join that one and blend into the crowd, and, and God may not ever use them at all in that place. You know what? If I was moving to a town where there were two churches, and both of them believed right, and one of them was huge and didn't need me, and the other one was rather small, and they believed right, I'm going to follow God's will wherever it might be, but there's a good chance I'd be, end up in the smaller one. Why? Because they need me. <laughs> they need you. We've had people come to our church before and say, well, you know, I really like the church, I really like the preaching, I really like the people and everything, but we're just looking for something that's got a bigger program. <laughs> well, and I say, well, you know, if people would uh, come and stay here, we'd have a bigger program too. <laughs> God wants to use us in the local church. And I, I said to go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, and then I kind of went off on a rambling course there. 1 Peter 5, 1. Here's how, here's how the church is to operate. Now I want you to listen to this. You, you who are listening by live stream, uh, you're trying to figure out what kind of church you ought to go to. Maybe you're saved and you're looking for a church out there in Timbuktu City. And uh, don't just look for the one that... Uh, 
It has the biggest and the best and the prettiest stuff. Here's, here's what the exhortation was by Peter the apostle to the preachers of his day. 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now watch what he says to the preachers. Here's the apostle Peter under the inspiration of God telling the preachers what they're supposed to do in the church. He says, number one, feed the flock of God which is among you. Okay, there you go. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go to a church that doesn't do anything but just preach the same old salvation message uh, every week after week after week, then you're not gonna gain. If you're already saved, you don't need to hear the salvation message over and over again. Now, I love to hear the old story. I love to sing the old story. But the truth is, God's people need to be fed. And we need something we need something from the Word of God that goes beyond the gospel. Now, we're going to keep preaching the gospel here because we never know when somebody might walk through the doors that don't really know the Lord Jesus. We never know when somebody who professes to be saved that might not really be saved. And so they need to hear the gospel. But it ain't going to be every service, not, not in its entirety. It'll be mentioned. But to feed the flock of God, number one. So if you're going... To find a church that's going to help you, you need to go where the preaching is going to be more than just the fluffy cream puff stuff. It needs to be more than the, the cream puff stuff. The easy stuff. Look, if you're never challenged, if you come to this church and the preacher never challenges you with anything new, there may be times when you say, boy, I don't know, it sounds like he's getting on something here I've never heard before, or I don't know if I want to do that. Or I'm not sure, this sounds like it might be tough to do. If you go to a church where nobody, the, the preacher never challenges you, you don't even need to go to church. You already know everything. You ever think about that? If you're not going to be challenged, what you're saying is, I already know what I believe. I don't want anybody to tell me anything new. <laughs> we need to be challenged to grow. And that's what's done in the feeding of the flock. Now look at the next thing. He says, taking the oversight thereof. He's telling the preachers, number one, feed the flock. Take the word of God and feed the flock. And sometimes it might be some, it might be some steak that has to be chewed. Hello? <laughs> might be a rib that you have to gnaw on the bone a little bit. But you need something new. You need to be challenged, learn new stuff. And then he says to the preacher, he says, now you're to take the oversight. Now here, here's what's sweeping the nation. Look up here. Here's what's sweeping the nation today. As a lot of churches say, well, we're going to do it the biblical model, and we believe in elder leadership where there's not just a pastor, not just a pastor, but got several elders who are leading the church. And so nobody's in charge. And so you got a bunch of guys, you got the the preaching elder, you got the teaching elder, you got the financial elder, you got all these elders that's running different parts of the church. Anything's got more than one head's a monster. Peter says, take the, take the oversight thereof. And so the oversight, and if you read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, you'll find out that the bishop is to be the overseer. Bishop is a pastor, same thing as the elder. And he's to be an overseer. Doesn't mean he's a dictator. Doesn't mean that he's mean and cantankerous. Doesn't mean that he is unfeeling and callous. Doesn't mean that he uh, doesn't get input from the church. Hey, we vote on stuff when it's worth voting on. We're just not going to sit around and have a bunch of, a bunch of uh, 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 business meetings to stir up strife. You know, the, the times that we've lost more people has been times when tempted to have a business meeting. <laughs> And I'm not saying that the church shouldn't be involved, but basically what needs to happen in church is a, a pastor just needs to lead and uh, put things before the church, not keep anything secret. If it comes down to where we're buying and selling property or something like that, then the church needs to vote on it. But we don't need to, we don't need to have business meetings to find out what color toilet paper to buy. We don't need to have business meetings to decide whether or not we're going to have our name, uh, the name of the church and address and phone number printed on our gospel tracks. You know, that's things that the that the overseer is supposed to take care of. We don't, need to, we don't need to have a business meeting to find out if we can buy some Lysol for the bathrooms. Isn't that kind of silly? And yet there's churches that thrive on that. Well, 
you just get you get a lot more efficiency and is bibliosity a word? <laughs> I just made up a new word. More bibliosity if you if you just follow God's pattern here. And he says, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage. He's not to be a smart aleck or, uh, or somebody who is like a cattle driver. Uh, somebody said that some preachers have made the mistake. They thought, uh, they thought Peter said, beat the sheep instead of feed the sheep. You know? And uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. So he's not being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. A godly leader will say, look, I'm going to do the best I can to walk with God and uh, I won't be perfect, but I'm going to try to do things right so you've got an example to follow. And that's what we all ought to be, is examples for others to follow. And then in verse 4 he says, And when the, sheep, the chief shepherd shall appear, that's Jesus, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's a special crown that, that, uh, that pastors can win in heaven. Verse 5 he says, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with what? Humility. That takes humility to be submissive. And yet, can I just tell you that in, in the major parts of families is a, a problem because there's not humility and there's not submissiveness. And, uh, and the same thing happens in churches. And he says, For God resisteth the proud, but he give grace unto the humble. Now, number three, we're still talking about how the Lord, through Paul here, is giving the right example. And uh, we talk about family. We, we have talked about the church. Now, number three, the uh, third thing I'll mention is the government. Government. In Second Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know what's wrong with government? Can I tell you, we can bellyache and moan all we want to about government, but can I just tell you that we have the government that we deserve. I'm saying America in general. Not, I, I, I don't think I <laughs> approve of, of everything that's going on in the government. Not even close. And I didn't put most of those guys in office. In fact, when election time comes, I don't win very many of my votes. <laughs> I think that's probably a good thing. I mean, most of the rascals who are running don't deserve our votes. Yeah. I'm tired of voting for the lesser of two evils. <laughs> I'd like for some, just a decent guy to run once in a while. But here's what I believe about government. You know what our government is? It's a mirror. It's a reflection of us. When I say us, I'm saying America. If everybody in America would go to a Bible-preaching church and believe what the Bible teaches and act like the Bible says we ought to act, we'd have a different government. What, what happened in 1776? Uh, you know, people got sick and tired of a, of a faulty government. And that's why we got the one that we did have. It doesn't look much like what we were given now. But it needs to change. And the only way it's going to change is if what we just read happens. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You know, until America turns from its ways, we can't, we can't kill uh, 66,000 babies a week and uh, expect God's blessing on our nation. Just can't do it. We can't have laws that protect a, 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 an eagle's egg and make it a, a prison offense to destroy an eagle's egg while you can kill all the babies in the, in the abortion clinics that you want to. When we have open season on babies and protect the eagles, we've got something out of kelter. That's a reflection of us as Americans. Let me give you number three, big number three, a position of helpfulness. It all comes down, I'd like to stop on a, on a uh, positive note. And so it comes down after Paul shows them what's wrong. He shows them how to get it right by looking at the, at the, pat, at the uh, picture of holiness. <clears throat> and then number three, there's a position. Paul takes a position of helpfulness. <clears throat> Look at it with me back there one more time. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 
And uh, Paul starts in, uh, in, in about verse uh, 23, actually, he's talking, to, talking about the uh, pattern of holiness. And then, and then in uh, verse 30, or 40, 31, I'm sorry, he says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And so he begins to tell folks how to get it right. And it becomes helpful to this, peop this people at the church at Corinth. And here's how we do it. It shows how to, once we get ourselves going in the right direction, then what do we do? We help others go in the right direction. You say, isn't that a holier-than-thou attitude? No, not at all. We're all still sinners. And we're not living a perfect life, none of us. But once we discover the truth, we're supposed to help others find the way. In fact, the Bible says uh, of those in the Old Testament, he says of the teachers in Isaiah, he says that you'll hear the teacher saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And we're supposed to help people see the way. We start with our children and we start with our families and we start with the people we have influence over and we go uh, on visitation and we, we try to win people to Christ and we try to point them in the right direction, a position of helpfulness. And, in fact, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1. Here's the attitude we're to have. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1. Brethren, he's speaking to Christians, if a man be overtaken in a fault, well, that's happening to a lot of people, isn't it? If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So, isn't this saying what we just pointed out a minute ago? Once we head in the right direction, we're supposed to be helping others head in the right direction? You say, but that would presuppose that we think we're spiritual if we help somebody else. Is that not what we're supposed to be? He says that we're to be filled with the Spirit. That doesn't mean we're sinless. It just means that we're letting the Holy Spirit of God guide us. And as the Holy Spirit of God guides us, we begin to be helpful to others. And uh, he says, restore such one in the spirit of meekness. We're supposed to be humble about it. And then he says, Consider, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Understand that we could fall. And verse 2, he says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, how long are we supposed to bear somebody else's burdens anyway? Well... Verse 4 says, But let every man prove his own work, and then, he sh then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Here's the way we do it. We get ourselves headed in the right direction. We help somebody else get on the right track. And when we get them going on the right track, then when they, when they know what they're supposed to do, then they're going to be responsible to keep themselves going in the right direction. Doesn't mean we won't help them anymore. But sooner or later... We can't keep propping them up till the, till the Lord comes back. People need to grow up and learn to live for God on their own sooner or later. I talked to somebody that I've helped over the years. I talked to them just uh, yesterday and uh, propped them up over the years time and time again. Propped them up and propped them up and propped them up. There's nobody in our church right now, so don't try to figure out who it is. <laughs> Propped them up, propped them up, propped them up. They'd fall, prop them up, fall down, prop them up. I encourage them, try to get them to go. Been slapped in the face and talked about behind my back because when that person happened to be in a down mode, I got blasted. Talked to that person yesterday and they're back in the down mode again. And I just asked the simple question, what, what happened to that commitment you made? And I asked it in a nice way. I got the cold shoulder. Now sooner or later people got to get up and walk on their own. I'll try and try and try, but I can't, I can't earn the rewards for them. I can't make them be faithful. You can't either. But we ought to be willing to help people. And if people really are sincere about living for the Lord and we help them get up, sooner or later they ought to walk on their own. Well, some people do have a, an, an imitation. I, I titled the message a cheap imitation. Some people have a, an idea of the church that's just a cheap imitation. Let me tell you what we ought to do as a church at Liberty Baptist Church. I'll just, I'll give you some practical things to think about and then we'll be done. Here at Liberty Baptist Church, what can we do? Well, what's Paul's premise back about the Lord's Supper? Everything has degenerated into chaos, right? 
well, what can we do to do the right things to keep our church going in the right direction? Well, if you want to have orderliness, then that will drive out the chaos. Has anybody got 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 40 memorized? Let all things be done decently and in order. <laughs> Orderliness. Let all things be done decently and in order. If we, want a, if we want our church to be the best that we can be, it won't be perfect, but we can head in that direction. If we want our church to be good, here's what we can do for the body of Christ here. Let me give you some things. These are just simple Sunday school teachers can take an interest in their class by preparing good lessons and making personal applications to their pupils that will really help their pupils to grow. We said we, we've got some growth going on. It doesn't happen accidentally. Sunday school teachers have to work at it. Just like a preacher prepares a message, Sunday school teachers need to prepare and pray and think about the people they're teaching and how can I find some scriptures to help this little boy? How can I find some scriptures to help this little girl? How can I encourage them? So it needs to be some good teaching. And, the, and, and Sunday school teachers can also encourage their pupils by going to visit them in their home. You know what that tells them? You care. Number two, members. Maybe you're not teaching a Sunday school class. Members who can sing can, can join a group. Sing. Serve the Lord. Guys, strap on a dress shirt and a tie and make yourself available to help Brother Paul take up the offering. Help Brother Denny out there and greet people as they come through the door. Brother Denny was telling, we were joking around about uh, I came in without a necktie on tonight. And I was joking with Brother, Brother Denny about it. And he had his own. He said, yeah, he said, you taught me to wear one, preacher. <laughs> the shirt. And uh, and Brother Denny, is, uh, since he's come to our church, he's, uh, he's involved in a in, uh, hundred different things in the church, just doing this and doing that. And, uh, and hey, if you want to get involved in something, just wear a tie and somebody might ask you to do something. Uh, he, might need you to, uh, he might need you to help out there to greet people as they come in. Sometimes somebody's sick and don't show up. Might need you to hand, help hand out bulletins and grin at people. Maybe they need you to help take the offering. Uh, ladies, put on a dress and volunteer for nursery duty. Oh, I didn't want to do that. I want to do something more glamorous than change dirty diapers. I, look, you get, paid, you get paid hazardous duty pay. My wife, that's why she works back there. <laughs> Boys, dress up. Learn your Bible. Come to church ready, and we'll have, uh, we'll have a youth night. We'll have a youth night where... Where the boys take uh, take the offering, we got some girls singing specials. Maybe get some of the young guys to preach. We will have a youth night. What do you think about that? Does that sound good? Huh? And uh, we will just involve all the young people. Just you know, give them a little push, get them started, and we'll sit down and let them do it. Girls, young girls, just insist that Miss Karen let you help serve the food and clean up the kitchen. Now she'll try to do it herself, but you just got to insist that she lets you help her. <laughs> Some of these ladies are that way. They think it can't get done if they don't do it. Visitors. I may be talking to some watching on the live stream or somebody's checking out our church. Hey, get a copy of the Constitution and read it. I can, I'm talking about our church Constitution. See if you agree with our church, and if you do, hey, join up. Be a part of it. Volunteer, be in on it. Preachers, have uh, have sermons ready to preach. Uh, we're going to have uh, maybe in the near future have maybe three or four guys to uh, to preach ten minute sermons some night. We just break it up. Have four guys to preach four ten minute sermons. How about that? And get and and uh, hey, we we'll spread the responsibility. Hey, we, brother Paul and Miss D are going to the mission field, running out on us. Gonna leave us holding the bag in the office back there. <laughs> I may need a, uh, I may need a, I may need a secretary to uh, to pay the bills. We may split up what they're doing now. They've they've done a whole bunch of different responsibilities, and 
And so uh, I don't know if we can find anybody else willing to take all those things or not. And so we may split up some different things. And we may have uh, a secretary who just comes in one day a week and writes checks and mails off all the payments. Uh, I used to say that I thought if I ever got a secretary, I wanted to get a uh, get an older woman for a secretary so everything would be appropriate. But now when you get my age, you can't find an older secretary. <laughs> I need somebody like that. I need somebody willing to learn to run the software. I need somebody uh, willing to do a number of the uh, accounting uh, procedures and so forth. There's a place for people to serve. And those who are willing to work with children, we've got a master club that's going to be starting up on Sunday night. Volunteer, get in, help out. I'm just saying, there's places to serve. And how do we keep disintegration from happening in a church how we keep it from turning into what happened at Corinth when those people splintered into groups and they began to bellyache and complain at one another and uh, they all just had their own leader and they were uh, making uh, making uh, a big to do out of the uh, uh, Lord's Supper and things like that it degenerated into chaos how do you keep chaos out by orderliness all things done decently and in order. So the more people we've got helping bring order, the more we squeeze out disorderliness and chaos. Does that make sense? And so that's what we're saying. So here's the truth of today's message for us. <coughs> Hypocrisy comes slowly, slips up on us before we know it. Holiness is when we separate from the world's ways. See, we think the way culture, we want our kids to be like everybody else. We ought not to. We ought to want our kids to be like Jesus. Not like they are on television. Not like they are in Hollywood. That's the world's ways. Holiness means separating from the world's ways and being like Jesus. Now you know how that comes? That may sound a little scary, but it's not scary and it's not weird. Let me tell you what holiness is. Let me tell you what living close to the Lord is. It's when you love Jesus more than you love the world out yonder. I'll end with this illustration. There was a New York diamond dealer by the name of Harry Winston who heard of a Dutch merchant, a diamond merchant. And uh, Mr. Winston came up with the, the diamond that he knew that merchant was looking for. He had described and he came up with a diamond that he thought would be exactly what that merchant was looking for. And so he called the Dutch merchant up on the phone and invited him to come and, and look at the diamond. The Dutch merchant flew all the way to New York City. And uh, as he entered the store, the, uh, Mr. Winston appointed his best salesman to present the diamond to this Dutch merchant. This Salesman was very smooth. He was very technical. He knew all the different facets about diamonds. He knew all of the, he, he knew diamonds inside and out. And he presented the diamond to the merchant, and the merchant didn't buy it. Mr. Winston, the owner who had been standing in the background, kind of watching at a distance, walked over and he said, uh, Sir, may I show you that diamond one more time? And he said, Sure. So he began to show him the diamond and, and his particular love for that diamond and, and how that diamond brought him great joy and how he saw the beauty in that diamond. And he began to describe that diamond from the heart and that guy bought the diamond. And after Mr. Winston had uh, some staff packaging up the diamond, getting ready to go, the Dutch merchants looked at Mr. Winston, he said, why did I buy that diamond from you instead of your salesman? Mr. Winston said, that's one of the best diamond salesmen in the world. And he knows everything there is to know about diamonds. He knows more about diamonds than I do. But he said, he knows about diamonds. But he said, I love diamonds. And that's the difference. You bought the diamond because I loved it and I described it my love. That's the way it is living for Jesus. You can know everything there is to know about the Bible. You can know all the doctrines and details. But listen, when we love Jesus, when we love Him, it makes a huge difference and what we've got becomes what other people want when we show our love for Him. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to invite you to come. 
Father, I pray that you'd bless the invitation. Lord, I pray that if there's people in this room or on, watching on the, the Internet that do not know Jesus as Savior, I pray, Lord, that you'd help them to receive the truth about the fact that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins. And, Lord, I pray that they'd be willing to ask him to save them tonight out of a sincere heart, believing that they are sinners and that Jesus died to pay for their sins. I pray that they'd receive him. Lord, I pray for Christians who may not have really seen the value of the church, growing in grace, maybe those who have had a low view of the family or government. Lord, I pray that we would see things from a biblical perspective and help us to change the way we think according to the biblical model. I pray you'd bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand as she plays?